Welcome to Theory of Change. I'm Matthew Sheffield. Thanks for being here. Before we get into this episode, I did want to remind everybody that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network. So go to flux.community for more articles and podcasts about politics, technology, religion, and media, and how they all interrelate with each other. And if you like what we're doing, uh, you can support the show go to theoryofchange.show and we have links to both Substack and also Patreon where you can subscribe and get full access to every episode. Most episodes are free to the public, but some of them in order to keep the show sustainable are um, gated episodes. And so if you have a subscription, you get a video and audio and transcript of every episode. So I do really appreciate everybody who is supporting the show and making it possible. We're not subsidized by billionaires or nonprofits or universities. We are made possible by people like you. And uh, if you are unable to support uh, financially, please do leave us a nice review on iTunes or uh, Spotify or any other podcast platform that you're listening to the show. And you can also please do subscribe on YouTube if you're watching there and uh, make sure to click the notifications to get notified when we are posting a new episode. So that is very helpful and helps spread the word about what we're doing. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get into today's program. With each passing day, Elon Musk is making Twitter worse. He's done everything from allowing neo-Nazis and trolls to come back after being banned to locking out developers and academics who want to use Twitter's Application Programming Interface, or API, to make interesting and important projects. A lot of people have had more than enough, and they're heading for the exits to places like Spoutable, Substack, and Post. The most popular destination by far, however, has been Mastodon. Just recently, Mastodon hit 10 million registered users, which is pretty incredible considering that while it has a lot of similarities to Twitter, the technology behind Mastodon is very different from the centralized social media sites like Twitter and Facebook. Anyone can run a Mastodon server or instance as they're called, which you can use just for yourself or a community, but you can also use your Mastodon instance to connect to or federate to the larger world through an open protocol called ActivityPub, which is so flexible that people have used it to build alternatives, not just to Twitter, but also to Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and create even other weirder, much weirder and cool projects. These servers communicating together through ActivityPub are called the Fediverse, as in a universe of federated servers, a network of social media networks. Now, if you're not a tech person, that concept might seem a little bit hard to understand, which is why I'm going to play a short video made by the YouTuber Black Indigo, which explains things in a bit more detail. And if you're listening, you may find the video easier to follow, so I'll have a link in the show notes for you to watch that as well if you want to. What is the Fediverse? To exchange emails, do you need to join the email provider of your pen pal? How about their phone network? Meow. Of course you don't, because standards exist to federate these services, enabling you to communicate with anyone regardless of provider. Without federation, you would have to subscribe to multiple providers. Or worse, the services with the most users would hoover up everybody else, eventually leading to monopolies and open to abuses. So why should everyone subscribe to the same platform to share videos and messages? Why aren't social networks federated? Each planet here is like a service provider. With a centralised approach, you can only interact with the people on the planet you live on. Now imagine if you could communicate with people on other planets. Imagine if you could share videos, events, instant messages, microblogs with the whole universe. Imagine if it didn't matter which planet you came from. Standards are a common language for software to communicate. Your login on any of these services allows you to interact with the whole diverse universe whilst not being tied to just one corporation. This is the Federated Universe. The Fediverse. All right, 
I hope that explains things a little bit better. And if not, there are some links in the show notes about Mastodon and the Fediverse, which you can look at as well. While all of this may seem just like a thing for computer geeks, the reality is that the Fediverse is a really exciting technology innovation, one that can and already has helped to empower regular people, nonprofit organizations, and governments to imagine and operate the internet in a different way, one that the way it used to be, one that isn't about just putting money in the pockets of billionaires like Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg. Joining me to discuss all of this in much greater detail are two different guests. Dan Gilmore is a veteran technology writer who is also a professor of journalism at Arizona State University. Darius Kazemi is a programmer and internet artist who also maintains a version of Mastodon called Hometown. The discussion gets a little bit detailed and technical sometimes, but I hope you'll agree that it is introductory enough that even if you're not a tech person, you'll at least find more than a few things of interest. The discussion does get a little bit detailed and technical sometimes, but I hope you'll find enough of it if you're not a tech person that you can still find of interest. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Good to join you. All right. Um, so uh, just to give a let's before we get into the uh, discussion, uh, I did want to have the audience get a chance to know who um, each of you are. So, um, Dan, why don't you just give everybody a little bit of background on yourself and uh, when and your connection to Mastodon and the Fediverse? Uh, well, I was a journalist for about 25 years. Uh, since then, I've been involved in a couple of uh, startups as a co-founder. I've been teaching uh, at uh, Arizona State University's Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications uh, for the past 15 years or so, doing uh, and, and writing books and doing commentary for a lot of different publications over the years. Uh, and I've become a Mastodon person because I could not abide the uh, new regime at Twitter, uh, which was uh, clearly going to be a problem from the d long before he bought the company. And uh, it was even worse than I had uh, expected. And so moving to another platform at a time when decentralization mattered more than anything seemed like the right thing to do. Okay, and, and when did you sign up for Mastodon? Oh, recently, like November. Of, of last year, okay. All right, um, and uh, Darius, uh, give us your little background on the Fediverse and, and yourself, um, if you will. Yeah, please. yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Darius Kazemi. I'm uh, based in Portland, Oregon. I, um, uh, I've been on the Fediverse since 2017, maybe late 2016. Uh, it was largely, my move there was largely, um, uh, 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 it was largely spurred on by myself making lots of um, useful and or fun Twitter bots that were starting to get banned in the wake of the 2016 election when uh, bot became kind of a dirty word. Uh, so the the platform became much more um, uh, um, harsh on bots and uh, started banning them. Uh, and so I thought, oh well, if I have this these art projects that I do, I should probably figure out a way to host art projects on social media where I'm still in control of uh, uh, of the infrastructure that they are deployed on, and people can still see them. So I started looking into alternatives. Mastodon was one of the options there so i signed up on mastodon.social then for a bit i ran my own server and then um i did a mozilla fellowship uh, an open web fellowship for a year 2018 to 2019 where i was uh researching among other things the fediverse and uh and similar technologies uh the output of that was a um uh a guide called run your own social which is available still at runyourown.social and uh, and that was a guide for teaching people how to run a small social network site for your friends. Uh, uh, that was um, published in 2019. 
And uh, I also created a bunch of Fediverse uh, technology as well, including Hometown, which is a modification of Mastodon used in about 150 different servers across maybe five, 6,000 users. And, uh, and it has special features for that enable small, tight-knit communities. And so I'm really interested in the ability for uh, entire communities to sort of come together off of other platforms and run their own infrastructure on the Fediverse uh, in a way that like makes sense to them and is governed in a way that uh, that makes sense for how they do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's one of the reasons that I wanted to have both of you two here is that um, you know I think a, a lot of people who are younger and you know, only knew the you know Web 2.0 quote unquote um, they 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 didn't you know they lost something in not seeing Web 1.0 emerge I think and you know both both of you guys were there as as I was I um, mean you know, I, I was making websites in 1996. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've both seen how the internet, it was a different place um, in the early days. Um, you, well, let's, do you, do you want to uh, talk to that for a, a bit, Darius, and then uh, Dan will uh, invite you to, to join in on that as well. Well, sure. There was a lot less um, corporate capture of what was happening on the internet. Uh, I mean, even in the late 90s, you still had places, you had places like GeoCities and so forth that would, that would act as hosts, but it was also fairly, it was still fairly diverse. Um, email hadn't uh, kind of consolidated around two or three big providers. Uh, it was uh, it was still very much like you would see someone's email address and you could tell what local, uh, you know, internet service provider they were using because it was their name at, you know, mylocalprovider.com type thing. Uh, uh, and um, it was also the, the barrier to entry for putting things online was a bit lower because there was uh, less technology to kind of wade through, even though it was newer at the time. Uh, and, uh, and social media existed in a very different way back then. Um, we had things like uh, Usenet and BBSs, which were similar to like forum sites and uh, uh, there were mailing lists as well. So there was plenty of social software around in the mid to late 90s. And IRC, uh, was, don't forget that. Yes, and, and <laughs> IRC, yeah, for, for chat. Uh, uh, but um, uh, but it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was definitely a different place, and it was not captured by for-profit corporations for the most part. Um, uh, it was, uh, IRC is actually very similar to what the Fediverse is today, where it was a bunch of volunteer-run services that sort of formed a, a network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right, Dan, well, what's your thought on that? Sure. Uh the, I'm, I'm older than both of you, so uh, I go back further on this stuff. I was uh, a, uh, I was online starting in the late 70s and, uh, and not counting, you know, communicating with a back end somewhere in, from a terminal uh, even earlier, but the the BBS movement was something I was pretty deep into, uh, and in the '80s there was something called Usenet, which most of your listeners won't know about. But that was, uh, in many ways, it was the original big distributed bulletin board system um, that was very Fediversey, if that's a, a word I can use. In, in its uh, architecture and people weighing in on everything from you know routine stuff to really weird stuff uh, from around the world and that you know evolved as Darius said to the post I guess when the graphical web shows up that's when there's a big changeover uh, and even the, the I, th I think of blogs as the modern internet, i.e. graphical internet, the first social media of that period, the, of where people were responding to each other on their the other person's blog. 
sometimes in, in your in own, comments, but always, yeah. always linking. And the comments, blog comments, were an amazing uh, forum for people. And but there weren't that many bloggers, so it's this is all a matter of uh, things changing when scale arrives. And the, the you know early Twitter was amazing and terrible at the same time because it broke a lot. Uh, I, I joined it because one of the people who started it said, hey, and signed me up without my intervention. And <laughs> I started getting these texts on my phone in the middle of the night because I was traveling and I thought, well, I don't want this and then came back to it. But I loved I loved Twitter for what it was always worried about the centralization aspect. And I think that's really the problem here is the, 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 the problem of a small number of giant enterprises having effective control over what we can say and do. And benign dictatorships don't stay that way. It's kind of a, a it's it's a law. I, there probably ought to be a law if there isn't one now. Uh, it just the the enlightened dictator gives way to the unenlightened dictator, and if the structure is set up for a dictatorship, you're that's what you're stuck with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that definitely is. I mean, what we're we keep seeing that over and over um, with with Twitter. Um, you know, when when we first you know, had this, uh, we're setting this, this uh, discussion up several weeks ago, I, you know, I had wondered to myself, oh, well, you know, is it possible that maybe things will have calmed down and Twitter will be out of the news and, you know, people will, I don't have to sit on this episode until, until Twitter, Elon Musk does something stupid and offends a bunch of his users. And I should have known that, no, he will continue doing that <laughs> every yeah, single that, week. That's um, good. That, that, that's a minimum weekly uh, status, but these days daily. Yeah. Well, and, and as far as that goes, um, you know, I think one of the things that has been a persistent um, uh, sort of phenomenon in response to Musk is that while a lot of the users have begun, you know, well, at least some have been uh, migrating to other other platforms, whether it's in the Fediverse or, or elsewhere, uh, you know, like back to Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, we haven't seen up until just recently with NPR and uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, um, the a lot of the biggest media corporations in, in the world have just sat there and taken it. Uh, Musk's, you know, deliberately antagonistic misinformation and, uh, you know, censorship um it's it's just been incredible and unfortunate to witness i mean and it's something that you've talked about a lot about in on on your mastodon post dan yeah i'm 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 really disappointed that journalists uh in the face of a, a truly direct and consistent series of slaps across the face and in the face of the uh, of a owner of a company who hates them with a passion and who believes in free speech only for his uh, or mostly for his uh, right wing friends and who is lending support to people who want to tear down democracy i'm i'm disappointed and that's the mildest word I'm going to use here the, is that that journalists don't see why it's a bad idea to keep supporting him and that's what they're doing by pouring their work into his site not to mention the fact that some big journalism organizations are still advertising on Twitter sending money uh, including it, ones who had their journalists banned by Musk. Yeah, it, that, there, that was the, just incredible. It, the cravenness of that, it, again, I'm, I'm wildly disappointed. And a lot of the people who were still there are friends of mine, and I, I'm going to respect their decision, uh, and I understand their decisions. But I just could not disagree more 
with their decisions. And I, I, I think it's, there was a moment when things could have changed vastly for the better uh, and still could. It's not, you know, this is not hopeless. But I think that there was, a, we, we had a powerful moment when something huge could have happened and did not at that point. Mm -hmm. um, did, what's your take on, on that, Darius? Well, I mean, I, I certainly agree with Dan. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed in especially the journalists who stay on there. Uh, it's, uh, it, I'm, I'm actually, I wish that there, I could wave a magic wand and make people understand that maybe some of the reasons why they're staying on there are actually not, um, are based on, on lies. Uh, uh, for example, uh, people who want to stay on Twitter, uh, maybe they want to stay there because that's where the traffic is, that's where the eyeballs are, that's where their audience is. And, um, you know, Twitter is incentivized to make you think there's an audience no matter what. Right. Like that's uh, they are their Twitter is the one giving you the stats that says, uh, oh, you know, this post got, you know, 30,000 views on it or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my what I always tell people and when I pitch this to, to organizations, including news organizations, what I say is, well, if you start your own server for like on your own domain right, WashingtonPost.com, social.WashingtonPost.com or whatever, right? Uh, and maybe your journalists aren't hosted there because they're independent people, but your projects are, your verticals are hosted there, your, you know, you could, people could follow style at, at social.NewYorkTimes.com, what have you. Um, uh, you are controlling that infrastructure and figuring out whether there are actually eyeballs on your stuff or not, right? Uh, uh, so you're, you're not being... You're not beholden to some third party that is incentivized to give you juiced up numbers. Uh, I think the um, when people move from Twitter to Mastodon, one of the things, uh, or the Fediverse in general, right? Um, one of the things people say quite often is, "Wow, the the quality of engagement is a lot different and better here." Um, while the numbers, the raw numbers, are significantly lower. Um, and I think that's in part because you can juice up raw numbers uh, quite easily, and you're quite and Twitter is is very incentivized to do that. Uh, so so part of it is, I think the reasons why people are staying, they're looking at the numbers and they're saying, well, it wouldn't make sense for me to leave. It's like, well, that's the trap they want you to be in, right? Like mm -hmm. that's that's exactly what they would like the conclusion that they would like you to draw, and so that they're going to feed you those numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just add. I would add that even if that's true, it's they should still leave. Oh, ab absolutely. Even yes. even if the numbers are there, they should still leave. But yeah. uh, yes. and and I've get I've I've written about this. I'm not suggesting that journalists one day disappear from Twitter and show up in the Fediverse. That's that would be a mistake. This take this is a staging process. Uh, it, it's a project that you manage by doing it in stages and bring the people who follow you with you to the extent possible. But you don't try to cut over one day and you're done. That, again, this is, this is quite feasible. Uh, and I think that we're, we're not, this isn't over. We're, we're going to still work on it. Uh, uh, there, we may hold some time in the next month or so uh, a day-long live online conference for journalists who want to understand better how to make a move like this, as opposed to why we've we've I think we've explained why pretty well. And mm -hmm. so again, this isn't this is going to be a process. And my disappointment is only that people who I rely on to see reality have chosen not to see it in this yeah. case. So something else that I that I always like to add to people in general, but this is especially true for journalists, I think, is that 
when you do move your social media presence over to a Fediverse server of some kind, assuming you've chosen wisely and you've landed on a server with a, an administrator and moderators who you trust, um, you actually have people who there who are incentivized to help you when things go sour. Um, uh, journalists often get brigaded and attacked on social media and that sort of thing. And there's only so much help that their employers can give them because their employers don't control Twitter. And Twitter is not really going to help them very much either. Uh, certainly not yeah. today. Um, uh, and, and, so, uh, and so moving on to these communities uh, where where you have people that you can go to when things go wrong and who are able to do things like, you know, like, like, like if one of my, I, I run a, a uh, Mastodon compatible server called friend camp. It runs hometown. And uh, when one of my users is being harassed, I can go above and beyond just giving them the standard, well, go block, block some people advice, right? I could, I can yeah. analyze, you know, uh, uh, logs for IP addresses and, and block IPs and th think, you know, things like that, just stuff that, uh, that almost like a personal touch that you can't get from a service with, um, 500 million users. Yeah. Yeah. In, uh, something to add to this is that we, we should not be preoccupied with journalists. They are one of the many significant components uh, of the Twitter user base, active user base, uh, popular or high number of follower user base that uh, that we should be trying to help. Uh, and we, I don't want, so, I mean, there are lots of things we could say about how journalists might make the migration, but I'm also very concerned. And I think that this is a real uh, advantage for Twitter at the moment. It is still the default place people turn for uh, headlines on breaking news. And that breaking news often includes local emergencies, not just national emergencies. You, you know, if it's a national or international emergency, you're going to you turn on the TV, you'll, you'll have plenty of information there. But uh, one of my brothers who lives in a fire prone area uh, in the Rocky Mountains says that, and he's not a social media guy at all. He, he has a Facebook account, but never uses it. He has, you know, he's, he doesn't, he's not into this. He, although he's a computer programmer, but he hates this stuff. And he, but he says he turns Twitter because all of the local agencies have accounts there and they also have websites that he goes to, but he, and he's very savvy about this, but he says, basically Twitter is the nervous system for the, uh, the emergency responders and, and information providers like earthquake, fire, flood, that, that sort of thing, hurricane. And it's, it's vital that we collectively find a way to help those people get off Twitter. Uh, yeah. And in a way where people are going to know how to find them again, a staging process whereby they say, "We, we're going to, uh, especially now that he wants us to pay thousands of dollars a month for the privilege of po posting essential information uh, on his for-profit website, we're going to go to uh, what they need is a. Uh, I think the best way would be to for some major foundation." to jumpstart this with a uh, probably a cooperative model where they could join a number of different places, but that would be aimed at supporting the emergency responders of the world. And, uh, and another one for local governments and, and state governments, agencies, and then rebuild an infrastructure that would be distributed yet connected through activity, uh, you know, through the, the protocols that are under under girding Mastodon and other Fediverse things. Mm -hmm. So if we could get that, we'd have a real way forward. But it's not expecting them to do it individually when they're already yeah, strapped yeah. for money and, and, and people. I mm -hmm. think that's 
hard and, and yeah. they need it's help. A, it's a heavy lift. It's a real heavy lift. And, yeah. and the other thing about it is to, to go back to what you were saying about um, with some of the, the policies that Musk has put in about the Twitter API and, and Darius, obviously you're directly affected and, and very knowledgeable about this. I definitely want to have you weigh in on it, but like it is, it's very, very notable that the, the specific changes that are the most impactful um, on the, from a technology standpoint that Musk has made have been to lock people in to Twitter. So like, you know, he's, he's, he's charging people for API access to drastically inflated fees. He's um, forcing organizations, he's telling organizations you're gonna have to pay a thousand dollars a month to be verified. But of course, you know, a, a local government traffic agency is not going to be able to afford a thousand dollars a month, and neither is you know, a city of you know two hundred thousand. They can't pay for that. I, that. I don't think that's lock in. I think that's lock out, and I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me that he that he's doing that. It genuinely makes no sense. Well, I mean, ultimately, I mean, with he basically the reason why he's doing these API changes is yeah. he's trying to make it so that, make it as hard as possible to simultaneously post. Um, to Mastodon yeah. and Twitter, so like he like he went and banned, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, a bunch of these Mastodon follower migration tools and and things like that. And um, but at, let's uh, let Darius weigh in on. I mean, what's your thought on some of these changes? Would you agree with what I was saying, or you have another theory here? Um, I I do partly agree with uh, with, with what you're saying. The uh, you know I I don't spend a ton of time poring over the details of the changes at Twitter because I'm mostly working on the future on the Fediverse now. But uh, but I did see some of the news of the of the newly costed API access stuff. And uh, in fact, I was at a um, a meeting of academic sociologists who who rely on Twitter to to study various phenomena, and uh, they were all very concerned that they were they were already speaking as though like, well, guess we're not studying Twitter anymore um, because we can't afford the new fees for all of this data. Um, I, yeah, I, I do think that that Musk is trying to prevent people from jumping ship uh, or even from doing that transition piece easily right he's just trying to kind of add friction there uh i do think it will backfire uh so i'm i'm sort of with dan in that it i do think ultimately it doesn't make a lot of sense um uh, if what you want to run is like a successful business long term um but you know i don't expect that kind of reasoning uh from uh from elon musk either so uh so who's to say right um I am uh, the 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 changes are are extremely hostile uh, to people who want to build applications and to people who uh, who want to to have um, uh, things like you know like an earthquake bot that that sort of thing is just uh, uh, it's just it becomes instantly not so feasible anymore. Um, so so I guess I don't have too much to add to that other than to provide that that little extra perspective there, maybe about the researchers too. Mm -hmm. It's and it's so contrary to what he was saying, he wanted Twitter to be. Um, I mean, I say that almost tongue in cheek, because he operates so often contrary to what he says, that in so many parts of his uh, expansive empire but it, it it just seemed to me that if he had done what he had said he was going to do uh, Twitter would be a lot harder to leave and instead it's become much easier mm, yeah yeah why well, that's I think that's true for a lot of people and and I will say one bright spot in terms of getting communities to make the migration um, has been uh, with a lot of tech journalists. Um, so you, you know, I, I have seen a number of tech journalists who may have initially kind of dragged their feet a bit, but then um, some of them have basically jumped whole hog. Like uh, Mike Masnick over at Tech Dirt, uh, he's basically moved to Mastodon full time and actually now has more followers on Mastodon than he does on Twitter. 
Um, so he, you know, he's a he's a good success story with that. But it's he's not the only one that. And of course, like I would say that that's probably uh, you know obviously the, the or Mastodon right now is, and the Fediverse generally is early adopters. So of course that's people who are interested in technology journalism. Um, I, but I'm, it shows I'm, I'm, that you can do it though. It shows that, yeah. that you're not throwing away your audience. Yeah, I'm a data point for this. I my. I, I had a not a large but respectable following on Twitter. Shot, you know, something, but somewhere I I never checked. It was like forty seven thousand, something like that. Not not a lot, but it, you know, decent. And I don't know what I have on Mastodon because I never even look. But the uh, it may be fifteen thousand or something. But I have at least an order of magnitude ten times the engagement on Mastodon that I ever had on Twitter, uh, mm -hmm. except period, you know, once in a while, something would catch fire and get, you know, 15,000 shares on Twitter, but that was like, you know, twice a year. Uh, and on Mastodon, uh, these conversations are, are rich and deep and only rarely required the use of the mute or block button which is just so opposite to way the way it was over at twitter uh, I, I, I think some of it is that people wonderful. are getting people are getting content that they are actually wanting to see if they're seeing a post from dan gilmore it is because they either subscribe to you or someone that they follow thought your post was was interesting enough to um uh, to share uh right there's uh, there's not these mechanisms out there that purposefully put your content in front of people who may not care to see it or may be completely ideologically predisposed against to what you're saying um, uh, uh, or what have you. Uh, I, I, I think I think some of it just has to do with the how the network propagates this information and the the level of control that people have over uh, what they see. Yeah. My my but, my one uh, regret in the Fediverse is that I'm not getting enough pushback on things that I believe, where I'm not positive that I'm right. I I I like I like it when people tell me I'm wrong in, in a civil way and tell me why I'm wrong. I I very much crave that feedback because sometimes I'm wrong. I want you should know. try posting technology opinions. You'll get plenty of, of pushback. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, I think in large, in large part, it may have to do with the, with the audience that it's reaching, like, because it's early adopters and, and the people who are active on Mastodon maybe skew more technical. They might just be more predisposed to listen to you and go, huh, that's interesting, you know, versus having their own fully formed pushback for it well yeah my journalism for years was about tech so it, i still have people in that world that i talk with a lot and a lot of them have come over to mastodon which is interesting I, yeah i hope we'll talk a bit about other fediverse things because we, I, I, it worries me that mastodon becoming synonymous with fediverse mm -hmm. uh, i don't think that's healthy yeah. Well, um, yeah, well, we definitely I definitely do want to get into that. I guess one of the other if I if I may summarize, though, and, and I feel like this is my own experience as well, is that, you know, when you look at the conversation on in the Fediverse, it is it does have that quality, I think, of the earlier Internet, uh, early Twitter, where people were there to actually discuss ideas and to enter and the blogosphere the early blogosphere i mean you know you, you and i crossed paths in those uh, the early days as well dan and uh i was on the opposite side of the aisle ideologically at that point but you know there was there was a lot of cross ideological discussion and people they were they were willing to have it and there was no um, you know, it was pretty routine to have people respond to each other uh, across uh, the partisan aisle. And that doesn't really exist now, I feel like. Well, that's partly because on at least one side, ide uh, ideology is more important than reality. So it's hard yeah. to and have identity for conversations also, yeah. with, with people who deny reality as a starting point. But, but yeah, I was... Fair. I, 
I have Republican friends who, uh, but they're more traditional Republicans. And if if they told a regular Republican these days they were on their side, it wouldn't be believed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so to what you were saying earlier, though, Dan, um, uh, and and we and that was in the intro a little bit. So the Fediverse is not only Mastodon. Um, it is not just about finding a replacement for Twitter. And um, and Darius, your uh, uh, your your hometown fork of Mastodon kind of is. I feel like in, and obviously you can speak to it better than me. But I think to some degree you're trying to you're trying to change the experience a little bit for the users of your on your side. Is that right? Yeah, and it's also meant to be a bit of a provocation too. Uh, like, hey, we can change things. You don't just have to accept how Mastodon looks. You can you can run different software um, and that that uh, hues to sort of different ideological foundations if you uh, if you want. Um, but yeah, you know, my hometown software is specifically it, it is ninety nine point nine nine percent similar to Mastodon, except that it offers ways to chat only with people on your own server, which I like because you've all agreed to the same code of conduct and the same governance, and you're all kind of uh, um, uh, if it's a small server, you likely all know each other. So basically, it's a way of talking in an inside voice versus uh, 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 an outside voice which can be nice but it's just an option right so if i want to um you know post a picture of uh i don't know a private moment that i had maybe i'll only post it to my local community and then if it's time to talk about a project i'm working on i'll post it to the entire fediverse um uh, mastodon has its own levels of abstraction around who gets to see what and you know essentially i just disagreed and felt like uh, uh there was value to putting emphasis on the actual infrastructure you're hosted on. And I don't just mean technical infrastructure, I mean like legal and um, social infrastructure as well. Um, and drawing uh, um, a, a sort of drawing a line around your local community saying, look, this is, this is the boat you're on here, right? And like, there's something special about that. And so uh, let's make that even more useful and also maybe encourage people to think a little bit harder about where they want to um, land uh, uh, on the Fediverse mm -hmm. um, to, to sort of have that community. But, but also, I'm always trying to uh, uh, promote other kinds of uses of the Fediverse. Uh, for example, um, I took a piece of open source um, event management software. It's kind of like um, Evite, uh, uh, like an open source Evite program. And, uh, and I took the code and I federated it. And what that means is that uh, ev people can use this. I used to, to host my birthday party every year. And in addition, so when I fill out the little form that says, oh, here's you know where the party is and what time it is and what day and here's what to bring, um, uh, all that can happen through email, but there's also an option for that to happen through the Fediverse. You can follow the account, you get a poll back at you, you can, you can RSVP yes or no, and do that all through Mastodon. And you can even subscribe to the conversations that are happening on there. And you can have conversations on Mastodon with people who are replying on the website or by email. Like it's an almost seamless experience for that. Um, and this is possible because we have these open protocols like ActivityPub um, that let us do this sort of thing. Uh, and so I want weirder, like like more, uh, more integration happening, kind of like how we had RSS as a glue between many, many, many different kinds of services back in the early 2000s. Um, I see ActivityPub as operating in a similar space. Uh, I used to use um, Yahoo Pipes quite a bit back in the day, which let you take RSS feeds and mix them together and put in filters and uh, and, and pull in all sorts of data. And, and you could basically take data streams and remix them and republish them and, uh, and, and make dashboards to monitor whatever you needed to monitor. It was, it was lovely. One of, it was a really formative piece of technology for me. And I think I'd, I'd like us to get there again. Yeah. Well, and uh, pipes. I got us. Oh, I, yeah, go I, ahead. For, forgive me. I've just got to throw in a word on pipes. It was the best thing Yahoo ever did. Yes. Uh, by a long, long margin, other than the original directory. Uh, hierarchical directory, which was great at, the, yes. at its time. Uh, but, oh, God, pipes. 
<laughs> I know I could go on. I could go on forever. We'll do. It, we'll do a separate well, podcast it, reminiscing about pipes, Dan. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it, when when they killed that off, it was really a bad moment because it yes. it allowed people who had no idea what programming was to do things that were incredibly sophisticated and that could produce visual uh, results that 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 even now you know you have to be pretty good at python to replicate a lot of the stuff that right just just did. just for listeners was... just for listeners uh who may not be familiar with this imagine a graphical interface where you could drag and drop a few things and let's say you came in and you wanted a you wanted a, a, a web page that would show you um, uh, a photo of every new baseball player from Japan that Wikipedia knows about, right? And then, uh, and then uh, uh, also with information about the city they were born in next to the photo, right? Like you could you could set that up without knowing how to program and and create a page that showed that sort of thing. It, it kind of the ultimate scraper and sorter of yes. information. It, 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 uh, yeah, and so I, 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 I'm still crushed. <laughs> yeah, me too. So what, what I would what I would like to do is 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 make it so that Activity Pub can can um, uh, uh, enable that sort of thing. Um, I built uh, an RSS to Activity Pub um, bridge service that's meant to be hosted by individual communities. So, for example, um, users on my server, friend.camp, have access to rss.friend.camp where they can drop in any RSS feed that they like, and then it creates a Mastodon compatible, it's not actually using Mastodon, a Mastodon compatible social media account that they can follow and then just get updates. So I have a, a, I have a list called blogs on my Mastodon that is following RSS feeds that I have converted uh, and uh, uh, and then it just notifies me when the blogs that I like have updated. It's it's turned my Mastodon into um, also a feed reader, a la Google Reader um, or or News Blur or something like that. Um, I, I've also uh, uh, modified Hometown to to accept a wider variety of incoming content than Mastodon does. So you can send whole articles via. Um, uh, via uh, Activity Pub, Mastodon turns it into a little link stub, and you click through and you go to it. But um, I've made Hometown uh, render the full article in line if you click if you click to expand it, and you can just read uh, you can read the whole thing right there if they if they choose to provide it. Um, so there's uh, there's blogging software that's Activity Pub compatible. Like it's uh, there's a big one called Write uh, that I use for all of my blog projects and so when you make a blog on there you can press a button and make your blog uh, so that uh, people can subscribe on the Fediverse um, there's uh, there's you know there's pixel fed which is meant to be a Instagram uh, uh, kind of replacement uh, there are there's a uh, gaff.io uh, gath.io is that um, event creation uh, that event management system that I federated uh, that uh, some people uh, actually do find quite useful for uh, for federating events. Like I really think we need a replacement for Facebook events, and so that was kind of like my first attempt at that sort of thing. Since there was software out there that already existed like that, uh, there's Bookworm, which is a replacement for um, Goodreads uh, mm -hmm. that is federated, um, and people can can track their their book reviews and follow other people's book reviews. There's 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 plenty more yeah. software out there too. And and what I want to see is not just a, a more software on the user experience side, but I want to see new types of data flowing around on the Fediverse. And I want to see Mastodon and other pieces of software ingesting that data. Like one of the one of the things that we're we were missing the one of the missing pieces for getting Mastodon to work with gaff.io as a um, as an events thing is that activity pub does support the ability to send calendar events around but when mastodon sees a calendar event it just goes oh, i don't know what to do with that and it just kind of throws it away uh, there's another piece of software called friendica that looks like facebook um, and when you send it a calendar event it actually populates a little calendar for you just like um uh uh, uh you know a uh, uh, facebook does uh, and and what was quite magical was that by providing that calendar event, um, I managed to get the event calendars just kind of working in Friendica without even having to do too much extra work. It was it was 
a really magical moment to see that just happen through the magic of interoperability. Yeah. Well, and, and we also are seeing some bigger um, c companies trying to actually do some activity pub stuff. So like WordPress, for instance, just announced that they're doing integrations with activity pub to allow you to have comments um, inside of your, uh, your WordPress blog that are uh, Fediverse um, comments. And then, and then also uh, Flipboard actually took a very big plunge into yes. the Fediverse and has done some really, really fascinating integrations with the, like, so they, they, they not only, so basically, originally they had set this up with Twitter that if somebody had tweeted an article that somebody had made a flip of, you could see the tweets below it, right? But then Elon Musk cut them off. Um, and then they decided to not only duplicate what they had done with Mastodon, but go one step further and then also allow users to integrate their own Flipboard account with a Mastodon account or create a, a, a they started their own Mastodon incident, instance yeah. of uh, Flipboard. So yeah, Flipboard's and, doing exciting work. Yeah. And, and then we're, we're, we're it's going to be interesting to see what medium um, comes up with as well. Um, yeah. As and Tumblr. Have, to Tumblr has announced intent yeah, you to wanna, federate. To, yeah, you want to talk about media? Yeah, and yeah. They here? so Tumblr is uh, is owned by Automatic, which also owns WordPress. So it's not you know a huge surprise that WordPress is also doing this sort of thing. It's part of their strategy now. Um, for for me, when people always ask, oh well, what's it going to be like when Tumblr federates? And my answer is a big. It depends. I mean, for starters, Tumblr has uh, something on the order of a hundred million users active which is approximately 10 times the number of active users on all Fediverse services combined right now. Uh, and so, of course, there is um, uh, uh, anxiety about what happens if they federate, right? Are they just gonna take over the entire stream? Is every post you see on Mastodon now going to be from a Tumblr user, that sort of thing, right? Uh, there's anxieties there. For me, it's also going to be very interesting to see to what level they integrate with the Fediverse because it's not an on-off switch. It's not a binary, we're integrated or we're not, right? They could do an implementation perhaps where all they do is make it so that Tumblr accounts can now be subscribed to by Mastodon users, right? And then, uh, and I mean Mastodon, not even Fediverse, right? Um, and, and so maybe they just do that and it's for a way for them to increase yeah. their audience a bit, yeah. right? For, for their users, right? Um, they could do any that or anything all the way up to turning the Tumblr dash, which is the kind of like a uh, uh, main dashboard that Tumblr users uh, uh, use to, inter to interface with Tumblr. Uh, they could turn their Tumblr dash into a full-fledged Fediverse client rivaling the Mastodon client, for example. Um, and um, uh, and I don't know where they're going to land in that spectrum. I imagine it'll be somewhere in the middle there and where they land is going to be very interesting and have a lot of uh, uh, implications, but there'll be very different implications depending on where they land. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think I, I agree with every word of that. I, my guess is that the, the, the major turning point coming in the sometime before too long is going to be when google.social shows up and we discover whether google can take over the fediverse or not and as they did with email right well they i, I don't use gmail but except on one account where i have to but it's a uh, then again everyone uses gmail if you look at your right yeah well and, and that is a yeah, and that is actually is a, a serious problem now because um, so I, I host my own email server and uh, if you, you know, if you for whatever reason get on Google's bad side, um, they'll put your email into spam and they'll never tell you and yep. you have no way of, of, of knowing whether you've been put on there or even appealing it. <laughs> And right, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure your you, you, one of your emails to me about this podcast, like the first one, uh, landed in spam, and I had to to, to pull it out. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That's that's an example of what I'm talking about. And and you know that's that's the kind of of you know uh, over centralized decentralization that we don't need in the in the Fediverse. Yeah, um, one of the one of the nice things is that we are by by we I mean um, implementers of Fediverse software and and infrastructure and so forth. 
uh, that is one of the main kind of um, uh, uh, negative scenarios that we're keenly aware of uh, and are doing our best to mitigate and plan around and so forth. We don't have any answers that can pr completely prevent that, but I think we are, uh, uh, we are at least approaching that as uh, something that we need to be prepared for. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, and, and it, it, there's another thing that's sort of uh, related to this is that, um, you know, so the idea of having a Fediverse server for a community of whether it's physical based or, or interest based, um, that is a, a tremendous opportunity, you know, like if you're a university, you could have your own instance. If you're NPR, you could have your own instance. Um, and you should. Like, I think all of these organizations should do that. There's a, there's a but, university in the Philippines that has a stu the student union has a hometown server. And so they use the local talk uh, channel to basically talk to each other about university stuff. And then it. Yeah. And that and like and that otherwise. is actually really a fantastic application because from a from, a, you know, a lot of. A lot of organizations that process um, customer data or you know member data or whatever, they have specific things they have to follow about allowing you know outside access to this data, and and this is where the Fediverse can really help you as an organization. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like you know, I've, you've, I've seen as somebody who's consulted with um, you know various internet projects over the decades. I have seen so many people try to reinvent the wheel of Facebook or reinvent the wheel of Twitter uh, or YouTube, you know, all by themselves. And, and, and it's never possible. Nobody has enough money uh, and nobody has enough server space to do this. You can't do it by yourself. But if you're, if you're integrating open source projects into your, into your work, you can keep up with it and you can do things that people really like. Yeah. And I like to, and I, and I do, I've been advocating ever since my Run Your Own Social document that it's like extremely important to bring over whole communities um, at a time. They can be small communities, but uh, it gets around what, what's referred to as the network effect of, well, I'm on Facebook because everyone's on Facebook, right? And if I go somewhere else, I'm going to be all alone. Well, if you bring 30 of your friends, you're not all alone by definition. Uh, and then that gives you the base to work off of to get comfortable and start, you know, following other accounts and and making acquaintances, uh, and really getting a foothold. Uh, and so that's one of the uh, the tactical things that I uh, recommend uh, to people is, uh, if at all possible, try and uh, try and bring over a whole, ideally a pre-existing community like that university that has. Yeah. Um, that has the server for itself. I have a I have a thought experiment that I like to talk about a lot, which, you know, would require me to wave a magic wand and give a lot of money to uh, the library system in the United States. But you know, I like to imagine what would happen if every local um, library system uh, had a social media server, and if you were a library card holder, you could have an account on there. And then at that point, your administrator yeah. becomes someone who works at your library. So when you have problems with social media. You can go knock on the door at the central library and like have a and conversation with someone. Not, yeah, if they have this. Yeah. You mentioned university, uh, and I have to, the unfortunately I have a university meeting that I have to be at in about two minutes. So oh, okay. Yeah. I am. Uh, I am really grateful that you invited me on to this, and uh, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We'll uh, we're going to be talking a lot more about Vetiver stuff. So yeah, really appreciate you being here, Dan. Okay, and and I'll I'll look forward to hearing the rest of what Darius saying. I'm fascinated by his projects, and 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 uh, Matthew, I'm really delighted with the work you're doing. So let's continue the conversations. Excellent. All right. All right. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time. Um, Take care, guys. All right. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, one of the other aspects that, you know, I guess there, there are two things that I'm thinking about with regard to these larger projects in the community is that, so uh, one of the other challenges of if a Tumblr decides to do a full integration, because um, mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing about Google is that they actually did very briefly have a, um, an attempt to have a open social network uh, with a protocol that was a predecessor of ActivityPub, uh, GNU Social, and 
you know, like so many Google projects, it didn't go anywhere. But, uh, you know, Facebook also meta is, is, you know, we don't know what they're going to do with activity, Pub, but they are talking about it. And, and they've, they've announced intent for sure. Yeah, they clearly probably are doing something. We don't know what it is uh, behind the scene. But, you know, it, let's say there is some player that does come in and try to provide a complete integration. One of the things that that's, I mean, there's going to be a lot of, of issues that could present themselves with that. Um, but one is that for small servers, the cost of running a, 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 a Fediverse instance is going to massively skyrocket under that scenario, wouldn't it? Unless you decided not to affiliate with it. Yeah, I, I suppose your choice, yeah, you could just not uh, federate with that server. Um, there's also the question of how noisy, uh, like how much extra traffic that would actually uh, cause. Uh, uh, if I if I had a server of 100 million users pop up tomorrow, right? Like how much would that marginally increase my traffic? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's going to be fun and harrowing to find out. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion behind the scenes in groups of ActivityPub implementers to talk about ways to reduce that hosting burden uh, to basically make the protocol less chatty, which would allow for um, less processing power to be required to uh, to process messages. Uh, so, so there's 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 discussion around this for sure. Um, there's also uh, you don't um, you know uh, I could imagine a world where. Um, uh, uh, servers could have some kind of uh, uh, the technical term is quality of service where you um, uh, uh, right now all messages are treated equally but maybe if there's a giant Google server we kind of put that in its own queue and maybe it's a slow queue and we serve that a little more slowly because this is not a this is a near real-time protocol activity pub but it's not a true real-time protocol like the like the video and audio that we have going over the internet to each other right now um, so and so it might be acceptable for messages processed from a google.social to be on a two or three minute delay for people or maybe not we'll find out right or maybe it'll be good yeah. for it'll be it'll be acceptable for some communities but not others um, yeah it's uh, uh, it's it's gonna be wild uh, but these are to me, these are uh, interesting problems that I enjoy having, uh, as opposed to the problems of uh, like uh, non-interoperable social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and storage is also going to be a, a problem as well under that. Yeah, there's scenario. there's some interesting work being done. Uh, there's a there's a cooperative yeah. called Jordage that is basically a bunch of servers that all kind of looked at the traffic out there and said, well, look, 90% of what we're hosting is overlapped with each other, right? Like, so what if we all went the in together? The same videos, together? the same... Uh, uh, yeah, the same videos, the whatever. same whatever, right? So what if we all went in together on one big Amazon bucket and uh, uh, and we all shared that together and we signed an agreement saying, you know, like, like that we're going to share and play nice with each other, et cetera. Um, and this massively but by sharing the costs it reduced the um uh, uh the server the storage costs for these um for these operators significantly uh since there's so much duplication anyway yeah well what so uh, i guess stepping back from maybe the the technical and server administrator mm -hmm. side of things um so you know I, I i've been on in the fediverse since i think 2018 um and I haven't, you know, obviously I've ramped up my usage a lot recently, but one of the things that I always get from people when I'm, when I'm on other platforms to ask them, well, so how come you don't, how come you're not on Mastodon or, or you know, any of the other ones, uh, Friendica, et cetera. And they always say, well, it's too difficult. I don't, I don't understand yeah. it. Um, yeah. I, I don't understand that, you know, like just, just simply, and just simply the idea of having to sign up for an instance or know what an instance is Yeah, that apparently is like, it, it's, it's really fascinating because people understand the idea of federation in email. They understand, you know, that you are, you know, X, Y, Z at 
uh, yahoo.com or whatever. They understand that. Um, but when it comes to social media, because of this centralization, excuse me, centralization that we've had, um, it's, you know, a lot of people, they, maybe they don't even use email there. Uh, a lot of yeah. people do not use email yep. anymore. Like they use WhatsApp or, you know, Signal or something right. like that or Facebook Messenger. And so for them, if you're not, if that's not your world, it's, it's difficult. Um, I mean, what are, I'm sure you've heard that from people. What are, what's your response when people say things like that? I mean, my response is, I mean, it really depends on the person. Uh, the one, one thing is, it is perfectly okay to just sign up for Mastodon.social. Um, I don't love the idea of having one server that is bigger, significantly bigger than every single other server. But like, if there's one that's easy to sign up for, um, you'll get you'll get in the mix, and then either Mastodon.social will be good enough for you, or you'll bounce off because it's not a good um, uh, uh, entry point after all, which would be a shame, but it happens. Um, or you'll uh, you'll migrate somewhere else after a time. After a time, um, I also recommend um, uh, that this is why I recommend communities come over together because when you have someone who is uh, uh, um, dedicated to helping people migrate, then it's not such a big deal anymore. Um, uh, I do a. Uh, you know, I only my server is sixty active users. We add maybe one user every three or four months. And whenever we do add a new user, I spend at this point uh, one to two hours on a video call with them, walking them through the interface, talking about what you can do, what uh, you know, uh, learning about their interests, and then giving them suggestions for how they might uh, make themselves have a nicer time uh, and and so on. Um, so so that's another solution to that issue uh, also i'm very glad to see um you know like the uh the tweetbot folks making a new uh, uh um application for uh that's mastodon compatible oh, yeah, tap bots. right tap, tap bots. Uh, just, sorry, yeah tap bots yeah yeah um uh, I agree. Make, yeah 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 making their new making their apps and and bringing their expertise in making user-friendly experiences uh, to um, to the Fediverse as like third party client providers, uh, like that's uh, that's ultimately a, a, an excellent thing. Uh, so I think it is getting easier. I am still I do I do consider it a um, an unsolved problem though. Still, especially the problem of like picking a server to to go on. Yeah. Well, one thing that I had mentioned um, a few months ago on on Mastodon was that. Um, when you go to joinmastodon.org or you download an app, that it should choose from a list of servers that had agreed to be included just randomly for you. And mm -hmm. then you don't have to worry about it, yeah. um, choosing the server. And then, you know, and obviously there is some, some centralizing under that scenario. But on the other hand, if, if it's a list that people can, administrators can opt in themselves, they control whether they're on it or not. Right. Um, then, then there's not really a centralization, and it, it makes it easier. And, um, and and it looks like with the iOS version of Mastodon, it is now the case that by default it will put you into Mastodon.social, but it does allow you to to choose something else. Yeah, it's. Uh, I know people have very strong opinions, uh, mostly against uh, uh, that idea. They see it as privileging one server over another, another to have it um, be yeah. a default. There, kind of, uh, kind of like yeah. Chrome making your default search Google, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. That's why I, I, I had wanted them to do the uh, approach that I mentioned, but you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. There are other clients that will that will sort of spin the wheel and just pick something at mm -hmm. random. Uh, I do like that they have the server covenant thing, which is like, okay, we're a list by agreeing to be on this list. You also have these like meet these minimum moderation standards, essentially, and minimum standards for a code of conduct. Uh, because you know you don't want someone to spin the wheel and land on a server that is totally ideologically uh, 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 opposed to to what that individual wants, right? Like that's that would be a bad experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, and then I guess one of the other things that's, uh, I mean, ultimately probably what's going to have to happen is that there's going to have to be legal. Um, requirements if we really want to open up social media that um, you know governments 
Um, so like a, a number of European governments have laws in place that they have to store their documents in open data formats. Yes. They ha um, and, you know, I, we're going to need to see things like this with because, you know, one of the one of the problems of centralization beyond the fact that, you know, you're letting individual people control things or corporations control things is that let's say for whatever reason your account gets banned and it might even be a bad reason like let's say you know you tried to log into your account too many times and mm -hmm. they decided oh this person's being hacked well we're going to lock this account out um, and and never respond to any inquiries about getting back in so this person is now banned from facebook um, that means their photos are locked up that means all their messages are locked up um, that means all of their friend list is locked up um, and they can't access it and they have you know they can go and make a new account but none of that's automated um, they have you know no real control over what they can do with their data and that's one of the great things about about the fediverse and open protocols is that if you do somehow get banned from a server for some reason or another you can still be a part of the network. You can still communicate. Yeah. There's going to have to be some sort of governmental in intervention, and and the politicians are going to have to get this, that yeah. this open access internet, like if we don't do something about this from a legal standpoint, um, the internet's going to be entirely walled off. Yeah, I mean, it gets to what Dan was saying about emergency response and that sort of thing earlier. I think it's a bit messed up that you. Know, you there are many places in, certainly in the United States, where in order to get municipal news, you have to have a Facebook account because that's where you can go to see what your city hall, you know, news is posting for their next, you know, town hall meeting or whatever, right? Um, I actually, I, I do agree with the spirit of passing laws that say that, say that basically, you know, um, uh, uh, public institutions need to be hosted on public infrastructure, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and I'm hoping ideally that we might, you know, if there were in my fan, fantasy way of the magic wand, as you were saying earlier, that have a, um, you know, have anti-monopoly laws that would force Fedder, Activity Pub um, support among these larger vendors, because it is, a, it is a serious problem and not as much perhaps on social, but it is a serious problem with what's WhatsApp. Um, yep. And uh, other places like that, that people have no ability to, like, you know, let's say they decide to pull out of a country yep. um, for whatever reason, and and that ha that's happened. Yep. Um, you're now all of your friends, you can't communicate to them. And I mean, we can you we can look. Literally, did nothing. Uh, this it was nothing even about you personally being banned. You have been banned. Your country's been banned. We can look at at history in uh, the late 1960s, I believe. I think it was maybe 67 or 68. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson passed a, uh, a law that said that all military organizations and all organ defense contractors that like do business with the military have to run computing software that uses this somewhat uh, uh, newish, uh, not widely adopted format called ASCII. Um, and uh, and that was uh, and and that law that was passed is the reason why ARPANET used ASCII because they had to, um, and uh, uh, and and pretty quickly ASCII became kind of a, a lingua franca for interoperability. But that happened because of a governmental decree. It did not happen because of market forces um, uh, uh, and like people eventually settling on what the best. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, 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 a protocol for that would be uh, it was literally just you got to do this because Lyndon Johnson said so and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it and it and it worked I mean uh, there's a lot of criticism that you can level towards ASCII it doesn't support uh, all sorts of languages that aren't Eurocentric etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but um, uh, that's that's one example from history of this happening uh, through those government mechanisms and uh, probably I I would wager had a pretty good um, impact on uh, on like setting the stage for something like the ARPANET to to come together and actually interoperate. Yeah, yeah, and 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 we see that that salutary effect in a lot of things. I mean, whether it's you know being able to plug your your phone into the same charger as your right. laptop, like that is because of the European Union that yes. said if you're going to sell a mobile phone in the EU. 
you have to use USB-C. Right, otherwise we'd be stuck where we were 15 years ago with, with 25 different kinds of cables for everything. Yeah, and, and, and sometimes it, it does seem like that some technology um, you know, programmers or entrepreneurs, they, they, some of them struggle with this idea that open standards sometimes have to be mandated. Mm -hmm. But that's the reality. Otherwise, you cannot move forward uh, because the market is to, you know, market forces are such that companies want to make it so you have to buy their adapters all the time, that you yeah. have to buy their, uh, you know, that you have to stay with your friends and their network even if you hate it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's there is a clear role here um, for for governance and, and and people shouldn't be afraid to say that I think yeah uh, yeah all right um, are there any other uh, projects or, or aspects of the Fediverse that uh, you're you want to make sure people know about uh, before we wrap up here oh my goodness I think the main one I'll talk about is one that I'm excited about today which uh, I have not announced formally, and I'll still be a little cagey about it, but essentially um, uh, I've been working with some excellent um, legal uh, uh, experts uh, on a legal guide for people running small uh, Fediverse servers uh, to talk about what your liabilities are and aren't. There are a lot of um, articles out there that are a bit, uh, in my mind, um, Kind of alarmist about your level of liability if you're running a social network site for 100 people um, and this guide is meant to say well look here are the laws at least in a u.s context and um and here is like specifically what like a checklist of what we recommend you know you do to make sure that you're that you're more or less covered to the degree that you can expect to be covered uh, uh mm -hmm. on these things so uh so i i, I was very happy to team up with a with a with a crew of, of very bright legal scholars to um, uh, to put this thing together, and I would expect that to be out in maybe uh, early summer. So, okay, cool. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a great initiative. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be sure to promote it when it comes out. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I uh, appreciate you being here, Darius, and uh, it's been a great discussion. I hope uh, we're, I'm going to be doing a lot more uh, tech-focused uh, podcast discussions. Uh, I'm, I haven't decided whether I'm going to launch a spin-off podcast uh, or two, uh, but I, yeah, in, in, a, in a, any of these scenarios, uh, we'll, we'll probably be chatting a lot more about this stuff. So I'm Sounds glad. good to me. It was great to chat today. All right. So that's the program for today. I appreciate my guests for joining the show. And I did want to remind everybody that Theory of Change is part of the Flux.community media network. So go to Flux.community for more podcasts and articles about politics, technology, media, and religion, and how they all intersect with each other. And uh, we'd definitely love to hear about what you're doing as well. So if you've got a podcast or you're a writer and you've got a project that you are working on, uh, please do reach out and let us know. We're on Twitter and Mastodon. And uh, love to hear from people with ideas to share. Thanks for being here, and I'll see you next time.